Hello and welcome to another slice of Daily Bread. I'm so glad that you have joined us today. Today's devotional will be brought to us by Pastor James Ash. Pastor James, welcome to Daily Bread. Glad to be here. Now, as always, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're, we're grateful for your loving watch care over each one of us. We're grateful for your precious word. And Lord, I pray that as we open and study its sacred pages, that your spirit will be our guide. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. The title of the message today is Waiting for the Promise. You know, Jesus had a very difficult task. And it's a task that any parent who has to go on away on a trip and has young children faces. Um, Jesus was faced with this problem of telling his, disciple, his disciples, which were like children, that he had to go away. I remember one time uh, when my daughters were young, my youngest daughter was probably about five years old, and I had to explain to her one time that daddy had to fly across the country. I was a missionary pilot in South America and, and we were back on vacation and I had some training, some flight training that I needed to do in Florida. And so I explained, I was trying to explain to my youngest daughter, Juliana, that daddy has to leave really early tomorrow morning. In fact, so early that when you wake up, he will be gone. Well, as you can imagine, that didn't go over very well. And so I understand Jesus had to explain that he couldn't be with his disciples forever. But he gave some promises, and those promises are found in three chapters, John 14, 15, and 16. And I want to cover those right now. John 14, verse 16. Jesus says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So what Jesus says right here is, I'm going to give you another comforter. The word another is the Greek word alas, and alas means one more in addition to. That means if I have an apple, a red apple, then alas means I am going to add another red apple. It's the same type. It's, it's, it's an apple, but it's also red. It's another. Uh, it's one more uh, numerically, but the word alas also means one more of the same type, which means that it's an apple. It's not a banana or an orange, it's an apple. So Jesus says, another just like me, he's gonna be like me, but he's not the same as me, it's in addition. And I, he's gonna be with you forever. He's gonna abide with you. In fact, a verse later it says he will abide in you. Now. Just 10 verses later in John 14, 26, Jesus continues on. The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. So we know that the Holy Spirit is a teacher. He will bring all things to your remembrance. How would you like to always have a teacher with you? Provided he's a good teacher, right? And he also not only is able to teach you on any subject that you may want to know about, but he also helps you with your memory, helps you to remember those things which you have a hard time grasping. Jesus continues, John 15, 26, but when the comforters come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now recently, I was called to jury duty. You know, it's an interesting thing. I've, I've been abroad uh, so many years, I've never really had to sit on jury duty. I've always seemed to be gone when they were calling my name. But this time I, I drew a short straw and I had to sit on the jury. And it's very interesting. You know, they, they call you for jury duty. And when they go through this court system, they call witnesses. And the witnesses all have to go before the judge, stand, face the judge, look him in the eye, raise the right hand, and he says, do you so solemnly swear or promise or covenant to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And they say, I do, I will. You see, they have to take that testimony because why? Perhaps someone doesn't tell the truth. And so they have to be put under oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Did you know that the Holy Spirit doesn't have to take the oath? Why? He testifies, yes he does, he takes the stand, he testifies, but he is the spirit of truth. He is truth. Every time he opens his mouth, 
truth comes out. So the Holy Spirit will testify of Jesus. He is testifying of Jesus. That's the function of the Holy Spirit, testifies of Jesus. John 16, verse 8, And when He is come, He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Sin, righteousness, and of judgment. I say the Holy Spirit is like my mom. When I was a kid, my mom, I, I, and I praise God, my mom, wonderful lady, and she would come alongside and she was an encourager. She would encourage her youngest son, which was myself. She would encourage me to, to do what was right. And when I was doing right, she would, she would tell me, hey, you're doing a good job, keep it up, or whatever. But I was a normal kid and kids mess up. And so she would convict me of sin. So she convicted me of righteousness, first of all, but she also convicted me of sin. And, uh, and there were times where I, I paid attention to her, but then she, if I didn't pay attention to her, she would convict me of judgment to come. And she would say, when your dad gets home, judgment, you get the idea. So the Holy Spirit convicts us of those three things, sin, righteousness, and of judgment. John 16, verse 13. Jesus continues on, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. You know, we need guides, right? Someone that can guide us into truth, that can show us what's going to come. You know, there's a lot of people that go to, uh, go to uh, people that do a cult to try to figure out what's going to happen in the future. Friend, if you're dabbling with the occult and you're trying to figure out what's going to come, let me suggest, turn to the Holy Spirit because it's the Spirit, according to John 16, verse 13, that will show you things to come. He's going to tell you what you need to do, when to do it, and um, so we need a life coach. Isn't that what a life coach is? A lot of people, very popular these days. People are wanting life coaches to help them with their relationships and with their careers and day-to-day -day lives. That's what the Holy Spirit is, the life coach. And so Jesus says, you will receive the Holy Spirit. But before you receive the Holy Spirit, you are to wait for the promise. In fact, Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Jesus spoke to his disciples. They were meeting for the last time, the Mount of Olives, meeting for the last time, and Jesus is giving his final instruction. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, uh, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have of me. So they were to wait. Now, Jesus says, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. But before you go, you need to wait. You need to have power. You need to have the strength to be able to do the Great Commission. So wait. Well, what does that mean? Well, we know that the disciples figured out what that wait meant. It says in Acts chapter 1, verse 12 through 14, it says, They returned unto Jerusalem from the mountain called Olivet. And when they were coming, they went into an upper room. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So the disciples realized, if we're going to receive the Holy Spirit, we need to wait for the Holy Spirit. And waiting doesn't just mean, you know, sitting around, twiddling your thumbs, just kind of looking around, waiting for the... No. They knew that waiting meant prayer. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus goes with his disciples. He says, wait here while I go and pray. Well, were they just to sit there and do nothing? No, Jesus was calling them to prayer. And that's what he's calling us to do as well. We need to wait for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the disciples were waiting and they were waiting for 10 days 
from 40 days to 50 days, which was Pentecost, right? For 40 days after Jesus died, they began in that upper room. They began confessing their sins. They began making things right with one another. They began seeking the Lord and, and repeating the promises that Jesus had given them. And as they were doing this, as they were doing this, they were, uh, they were praying that God would fulfill His word and that He would give the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, it says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there was a, came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak as with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. So imagine that. All of a sudden, they're praying, they're praying earnestly, seeking God. And then all of a sudden, there's a sound of a wind, a hurricane force. The wind is blowing and it's coming through there and tongues of fire and their tongues became on fire their literal tongues, and they began to speak in other languages, all these different language groups. They began preaching the Word of God with boldness as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. Now, there were a bunch of people there that were wondering, hey, what is going on? What is happening here? And so Peter got up and he lifted up his voice. He said, ye men of Judah and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be it known unto you, that these people are not drunk. There, there were some false accusations that were floating around. Ah, they've been drinking too much. He says, no, they're not drunk, as you suppose. It's only the third hour. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. It's, it's too early to drink. This is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And then he begins to preach a powerful sermon. And at the end of the, the sermon, he finishes it with this. Then Peter said unto them, well, first of all, verse 37, now, when they heard this, they heard this sermon, there was a, a, a conviction. Remember, the Holy Spirit convicts of three things, right? Sin, righteousness, and judgment. And they were feeling convicted. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter, without skipping a beat, in verse 38, he says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So the people were crying out, what do we do? They were convicted. They were convicted of sin. And, and they said, what, what, what should we do? And, G, and, and immediately Peter says, repent, be baptized for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So in order to receive the Holy Spirit. If you want to receive the Holy Spirit, and I want to receive the Holy Spirit, there's only one way to receive the Holy Spirit. First of all, we must repent of our sins. Secondly, we must be uh, baptized and receive the gift of baptism for the remission of sins. That's what baptism is for. That's for, it's not just getting wet, but you're uniting your life together with Jesus in this symbol called baptism. And baptism is for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting that a chapter later in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Peter is preaching another sermon. This time he's preaching it in the temple. And uh, he's just healed a man who was lame. Peter and John went up to the temple to pray, and they found a lame man uh, right there at the, at the entrance of the temple. And... The man was looking for alms, and Peter says, I don't have any alms, but what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Reaches out, grabs him by the hand, and jerks him to his feet, and instantly the man was healed. Now, obviously, this got the attention of everyone around, and so Peter preaches another powerful sermon, and at the conclusion of the sermon, he, the, the people were wondering, what shall we do? You know what Jesus well, what Peter said, Peter said the same thing. Repent. 
Ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So repent, be converted, which the symbol of conversion is baptism. Your sins are blotted out, and there will be times of refreshing that will come from the Lord. Now at that time, the, the, the authorities swooped in. They were very upset. But the promise is still true to us today. Do you want to receive the Holy Spirit? You know, Jesus, that was almost 2,000 years ago. And I believe that Jesus is about to come. And just as there was a preparation for Jesus' first coming, and when John the Baptist came, he said, repent for the kingdom of God at its at hand. Then Jesus comes along and says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And if we want to be ready for Jesus' second coming, my friends, we must repent and ask God for forgiveness for our sins. And when we do, we can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I hope that's your desire. The greatest gift that God gives to his church is the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the one thing, the one gift that brings every other gift in its train. It's the engine that pulls the entire train of our Christian experience. Do you want that? You need to repent. And when you repent, then and only then are you given the authority to be able to say, okay, God, after you've cleansed me from all sin, I want you to fill me with your presence, with the Holy Spirit. That's what I want. And I pray that's what you want too. Shall we pray for it? Let's do it. Father in heaven, you have given us the gift which is above every other gift. You've given yourself in Jesus, but then as Jesus went back to the Father, you gave us the Holy Spirit, which allows Jesus to be here with us at this time. And so, Father, I am praying right now that if there is something in our life that, has, that it comes between us and you, Lord, we repent. We ask that you would take it out of the way, that you would remove it, forgive us, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We put our finger on that Bible promise, Father, and we claim that. But we also realize that as we are cleansed, Lord, that we also need to receive the second part of that and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And today we want the Holy Spirit because it's the Spirit of God that enables us to live a Christ-like life. We need it, we ask for it, and we thank you because you will give it to us. For we prayed it in Jesus' name, amen.